book is really scary. It's about injecting nanobots into the bloodstream and use humans as guinea pigs. Maggie, do you even know what they really do in nanotechnology? But that's what it is, right? Really tiny particles in humans. They are tiny particles. So, for instance, imagine this whole place is like your heart, and that book is the size of a cell. A nanoparticle would be less than the size of one little letter in that book. Wow, I'm very impressed. Could you show me more about this? Yeah, let's go take a look. Sure. So in order to see our particles, we're going to interview Dr. Bevan, who's an expert at imaging and looking at movement of nanoparticles. Well, once nanoparticles get very small, it, it's, it's hard to see them um, just in a regular microscope. So, so today, instruments like the, the ones we use in my lab over here, we, we have special tricks where we shoot lasers at the particles, and uh, it helps light them up so that, so that we can study very tiny particles that they couldn't look at in the past. Hmm. And what does that help us do? What sort of interesting uh, properties or uh, things can we control based on that? Well, in a way, you have to see particles to understand how they interact with each other, how they move around. And so if you really hope to manipulate nanoparticles and technologies, it helps to be able to see them. So historically, the, the fact that, that people couldn't see these tiny particles made it hard to try to engineer them to control how those particles interact with the cell or with each other to build tiny structures. So it's only that we can see them and, and measure them at, that we can understand them well enough to, to engineer them. Oh, yeah, so that was really cool. Um, are there any more labs that do this work? Yep, there are. Let's go check one out. Okay. So what does your work have to do with nanoparticles? Well, our work is uh, a little bit different in that, so when you think of a nanoparticle, you typically think of a very small sphere. And a lot of these spheres work really well, but sometimes, even in nature, things come in different shapes and different sizes. So our lab is kind of working to see how we can engineer these nanoparticles so that they're not just spherical, so that they have these different shapes and different sizes, maybe like a, a small rod or even like a string-like shape or a worm-like shape, and seeing how these different shapes can affect uh, the nanoparticle delivery, how it traffics through the blood, how it flows in, the, in, the, in a blood vessel, how it is, interacts with a, a cell, how it gets inside the cell so that it can deliver its cargo in the most efficient manner. And there's also a number of different experts in the field that are looking at how these, how these nanoparticles are and how safe they are. And I can direct you to them if you're interested in learning more about this, uh, this topic. Yeah, sure, that would be great. Thank you very much. Ooh, let's go check it out right now. Okay. So, Dr. Brisi, we've heard a little bit about some of the benefits of using nanoparticles. We're wondering, what are some of the health and safety concerns when you're using particles that are as small as nanoparticles? So anytime you release particles to the air, whether they're nanoscale or micron scale particles, uh, you can inhale them. And there's a risk associated, potential risk associated with that inhalation. Now that risk is a little bit different for nanoscale particles because of their size. Because of their size, they can penetrate deeply into the respiratory tract, mm -hmm. and they can also then perhaps enter the bloodstream and become systemically uh, available to other tissues within the body as well. So the concern is about the scale of the particles and the unique health risks that might be associated with that size. My laboratory measures particles in the air. And we do that for particles that are outdoors, from normal air pollution, some of which are the same size scale, by the way, as these engineered nanoscale particles. The, the toxicity or risk may be associated with their size and where they deposit in the respiratory tract and how bioavailable they are. Mm -hmm. But they also may be a function of kind of what they're made of. So if there's some metals that they're part that are there or other kind of unique compositions to them may be contributing to the potential toxicity. So we would measure the particles in, in a laboratory setting, in a workplace setting, or in the ambient air. Well, I'm glad to hear that there are so many labs at Hopkins working on nanotechnology. Indeed. And if you wanted to read something more informative than that other book, you can read the INBT newsletter. Oh, thank you very much. No problem. Let's go get some lunch. Okay.